We've been uh, speaking on the subjects of the promises of God, the precious promises of God, and the exceeding great and precious promises of God. And those are the phrases that are used in the Word of God to describe how God in his faithfulness has communicated to us that he will do certain things on the condition that we do certain things. That's uh, the way that he's designed it. That uh, he, And he's given us these promises. I will do this, I will do this, I will do this, if you will do that. And uh, of course, part of the problem is that from the beginning we have a difficult time holding our end up and uh, that's why we have all the problems we have in the world. But the fact is that there are these precious promises and I would like to uh, uh, just uh, quickly uh, review them. But first I want to read you again the scripture that was read uh, from Second uh, Peter uh, chapter uh, two, 1 verses 2 to 4. And uh, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. Now there's the key, the knowledge of God. By nature, man does not have a true knowledge of God. He's got theories, he's got ideas, he's got concepts that he's uh, developed uh, some close to the truth, some far from the truth, some crazy, some sane and rational, all kinds of ideas people have about God, but they're all man-made until they come to the clear, simple, pure revelation of God as he really is. And, and that's what Peter's talking about when he says, grace and, mul grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God, which means the true and living God and the true and true knowledge of God. And then he says, according as his divine power, his God's divine power hath given unto us free gift, given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So what he's saying is that the divine power of God is available for mankind, for humankind to come to know him. Millions and billions of people aren't interested, just busy doing their own thing. Some search, and some find, but God is, the Bible gives a picture of God whose eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth looking for people who will turn their hearts over to him so he can reveal himself to them. When he reveals himself to them, there's an inward awareness of the true and living God that you can't explain rationally. You can't explain it as, well, uh, the guy's smart, so he understands. No, it's a gift from God in the heart of a human being that he gives. And it says, godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. And glory is the glory of his grace and love. And virtue is good, holy, pure living living according to his word, according to the divine principles of the Bible that are the way of life. And the opposite of the, that way is death. The wages of sin is death. And we see that continuously all around us. Some of us uh, experienced it. So then he says, the knowledge of him that call us to glory and virtue. Verse four, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Promises. A promise is something that someone gives to you. 
He says, I will do this, or I will give you this, or I will go there. I will. It's a, it's a commitment. It's a, it's a positive thing, a promise. And, and a broken promise is, 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 is a tragedy. And uh, of course, we know all about that. But the point is, he says, precious promises. And he says that by these promises, God has revealed promises in his word, in the Bible, promise after promise after promise. I will do this. I will do this. I will do this. All these things that he promises to do. And he says, precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. What an incredible statement. Here tucked away in the back end of the New Testament in the book of Peter, uh, he talks about individual human beings, natural men who live, live their lives and die and that's it. Just like, like animals except their spirit goes out for judgment. The point is that these people, these millions of people have the potential, the potential to share in God's very nature. God is willing to share his eternal life, his eternal spirit, his eternal perfection, his eternal beauty, his eternal goodness. He wants to share that with his creatures. That's the point. God so loved the world, mankind, literally, literally the cosmos, the humanity. God so loved that he gave his only begotten son that whose who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life, divine nature. So he says, partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through evil desires, through lust. Now, uh, the, the key there is that there's a change of our direction, our desires, our lives, once we have become partakers of the divine nature. That's being what Jesus said to Nicodemus when that great Pharisee, wonderful, honest man, good man, uh, just wanted the truth, came to Jesus by night and said, we know, we know, these, here's, the, here's, the, here's the top teacher in Israel. Uh, Jesus calls him that. He said, you know, you're the top teacher in Israel. And he is, and he, he comes to this itinerant prophet from Galilee that some people worship, some people hate. Uh, he comes to him at night and he says, we know who's we. Well, who, who he meant, we're not sure. Some of the Pharisees, some of the people, uh, many of the people, we know what? That you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs and wonders and miracles except God be with him. And what does Jesus say to Nicodemus? He doesn't say, oh yes, you're right, Nicodemus. You got the right person. I am he, that's right, blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. He says, verily, verily, I send to you, except a man be born from above, born partaker of the divine nature, he cannot even see the kingdom of God let alone enter it. So this is a, this is a picture here that, that he gives us. He says that it comes, this experience of becoming a part of the family of God, a child of God, as John said, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. What an incredible thing. He's thinking of Jesus as the, now he's on the other side of Pentecost. John, when he writes this in his epistle, uh, and now he knows that that person that was with him, when he was with him, recognized him as the, he recognized him as the Messiah, but he didn't realize that he was, 
he was living with the living God, the God and God himself in the flesh. As the Bible says, God became flesh. And the, the word was made flesh. That means human. And, but it was God. And after Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, John and the rest of the disciples and all the Christians since then should know that this indeed uh, was God incarnate, God himself who came and uh, uh, gave himself on the cross that we might be forgiven and accepted. So here he's saying we can become partakers of the divine nature. Now, what are some of these promises? The first thing we saw was we need pardon. And there is the promise of pardon. Promise, God promises. He says, if you confess, I will forgive. If you will acknowledge your sin, just face it, admit it, and, and come to me and ask, I will cleanse you and forgive you from your sin. Now, the fundamental basic assumption behind that is that a person is willing to be honest enough to acknowledge that they are sinful, that, that they, they fall short of the glory of God, as the Bible says, all we have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you have to face that, admit it, and say, okay, you can't be covering it up and making excuses and say, well, that's the way I was brought up or that's the way I was born or this or that or the other. No, we have to admit it, face it, that I am guilty of going my own way in my heart. And now I'm willing to turn around and say, it's called repentance, turn around and say, yes, I am guilty. I need your pardon. I need your forgiveness. So pardon is the first thing. And the Bible says that he forgives and cleanses us from all sin. Uh, and, and so the, the first need is pardon. And what pardon brings immediately when we come to Christ is a measure of peace with God. In other words, I don't know the degree of how people feel before they come to the Lord. There are various degrees. Some people feel very guilty. Some people don't feel hardly guilty at all. But when they hear the gospel of Christ come to the Lord, they, they, but whatever degree of, of alienation is in their hearts disappears. And they come and it's gone. And there's peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God. I'll never forget the first time that verse hit me uh, as a young Christian, as a new believer, when I read Romans uh, chapter 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Peace with God. God's, I don't have to worry about God being mad at me. He's not mad at me. He's not angry with me. Oh, yes, you hear sermons, oh, sinners in the hands of an angry God and all that stuff. That's Old Testament stuff. That's one thing. In the New Testament, God is a God of grace and love and mercy. And he wants, all he wants to do is forgive and cleanse and deliver. That's it. God so loved. And so uh, we, we come and, and he says, I am not angry with you. I accept you totally. You are my child. Why? Because someone has paid your sin debt completely and you're washed in the blood of Christ. So he says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. So pardon brings peace. And then peace brings power. Peace brings power. When the Holy Spirit comes into the heart of the believer, then there's new power. New power to understand why I don't want to sin. Why I don't want to do those things I used to love to do. And uh, get involved in all the stuff that's so 
destructive and hurtful and yet puts on a nice pretty appearance in the world and says oh no this is good this is nice this is fun this is happy this is no we, we have a new power to see through the vanities of the world and the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life we see through that we, we don't need that anymore we've got something deep inside that satisfies the heart so I don't need the vanities of the world a new power to say yes to what's right and no uh, to what is wrong so the beautiful thing is that God is uh, seeking people to come and uh, receive pardon and peace and then uh, to uh, uh, grow and become stronger and have more and more of his power in our lives the power first of all changes us it's his power and uh, i'll never forget what happened to me when i first came to christ i was 21 years old and i was out there doing all the everything bad i could find to do and the lord got hold of my life and i uh, broke me down and i prayed and i cried to god for mercy and and i remember the 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 the, the peace and the blessing of knowing that he had accepted me. And, and all of a sudden, I could see through the old way. And I said, what a, well, I must have been crazy. Why, was I, why would I do those things? I look back and say, who is that person? And it was me. <laughs> but but the, 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 the change comes from the presence and the power uh, of the Lord. So uh, that's the third uh, promise. He promises us power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The, and he calls it the promise of the Father. The promise of the Father. What? The Holy Spirit himself, God's nature, comes in and gives us new power. And uh, the scripture that we... Uh, uh, Saul was in 1 uh, Corinthians where uh, the Apostle Paul addresses uh, these people who have been so bad. Uh, Corinth was a horrible place and uh, just idolatry, immorality, it was famous for immorality. Uh, female and male priests and priestesses in the temple, all kinds of sick worship was going on and Paul went there and he said when I came I came with fear and trembling why he knew of their reputation he said so when I came I didn't come expecting to use some philosophical wisdom to convert you he said I came not knowing anything but the power of God the power of the Holy Spirit and he preached it and people were transformed cleansed changed made new and here's what he says he says know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of god okay point number one he says the unrighteous those who persist in living their own lives and rejecting the law of god rejecting the word of god rejecting the moral level of the scriptures and uh, the uh, sexual ethics of the scriptures they don't want that they want to do their own thing okay they're not going to inherit the kingdom a tragedy ultimate infinite tragedy to miss heaven and that's what he's saying they're going to miss heaven and he says be not deceived neither fornicators idolaters adulterers effeminate abusers of themselves with mankind thieves covetous drunkards revilers extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Boy, that's, that is an ugly list, and that's only part of it. But then he says this, and this is the beautiful part, in verse 11 of chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, he says, and such were some of you. <laughs> he just listed all these horrible things, and he says, you were into that. That was your life. You loved it. He said, such were some of you, but you are washed. You are set apart, sanctified, holy, 
justified, accepted as perfect in God's sight, in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. What an incredible, incredible statement. Such were some of you. We might say that about us. Well, we, I don't know. I'm not that bad. I wasn't that bad. I'm not that bad. Okay, that's fine. But still, we all come short and fall short. And he says, we are now washed. We are sanctified. We are justified. It's beautiful. That's the promise. And that's the power, the power that God gives. And that power involves purity. And that's exactly what he's talking about there, purity. And uh, the last thing I want to talk about today is the promise, okay? He promises all these things to help us to be pure, to be power, have power, uh, to do the right thing, and uh, to have peace, and to know we're pardoned. But also, he gives us promises to prayer. Prayer, so vital, so vital. Prayer is our contact with the Lord. Prayer is talking to God don't see him, don't feel him, don't understand him, but he's there and I can talk to him and I know he's there. I'll never forget the night I came to Christ. Uh, I was on my face and I said, God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And the Lord cleansed me and forgave me on the spot. And when I got up out of there, the one thing that, that, that just overwhelmed me was, I could sense that Jesus was right there, really there with me. He had come to me somehow, not physically, not visually, but somehow I felt his favorable presence, his love filled my heart. And uh, I have to say, I'm sorry that that didn't last forever. Uh, a few days later, I started getting back to normal. <laughs> but, but, but at first, I just was so aware of his presence and uh, his, his, his being with me. And I could talk to him and knew he heard me. And how wonderful it was. And the, one of the things that was so vivid to me was all of a sudden, I started getting my prayers answered. I mean, I'd, I'd prayed and I was... I'd come home drunk and pray. Uh, <laughs> it's crazy. But, but, but now all of a sudden, I mean, why? Because I was praying the right things. And the Holy Spirit was leading me to pray the right things. And he was answering prayer. And it was so beautiful. Now, this is the life God wants for us. It's up and down. Uh, we don't always feel it. We don't always have the strength and and uh, peace and uh, feeling and uh, emotion that we want, but, but we know at the bottom it's real. He's there, and uh, we can talk to him, and he has promised to hear our prayers. Call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Call unto me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened. Everyone that asks and keeps on asking receives, and so forth. Ye have not, James said, because ye ask not. Ye have not because ye ask not. So the power of prayer. In closing, I want to tell you about a man who lived in the 19th century. His lifespan just about the whole 19th century. His name was George Mueller, George Mueller. He was a wretched thief, a liar, a cheater. He was everything bad as a young man, and he got totally converted by going to a Bible study, hearing the Word of God, transformed, cleansed, went from Germany to England, hooked up with a pastor there, started to preach, and then God put it on his heart to reach orphans. So he spent the next 60 years 
having orphanages. From those orphanages, missionaries went out all over the world. From those orphanages, young people went out and served the Lord and were productive people, kids who were outcasts, who had no families, no parents, no nothing. In fact, he cared for 10,000 plus orphans uh, during his lifetime. And uh, he established 117 schools for, for, for young people, for children, and a Christian education uh, for more than 120,000 uh, young people. So George Mueller, the secret of his life was this. When he first decided to reach out to orphans and to serve God in that way, he had to raise money to build an orphanage or buy an orphanage. So what did he do? He prayed. That's all he did. He said, I feel like God wants me to do everything I do through prayer alone. Never in 60 some years ever asked for a penny. Never solicited contributions. All he did was pray when he needed something. And God developed in him a prayer life where he would ask and receive. Sometimes there were times when the, they didn't have anything to eat, all his orphans, and, and he, he'd say, all right, let's thank the Lord for the food. <laughs> and he began to pray, and somebody at the door, a big wagon full of food broke down in front of his door. <laughs> and, and God fed everybody. And that happened different ways, different ways. Having things repaired in the building, he prayed, uh, and, and the Lord worked it all out. One time he was coming to America to speak in Canada, and he was coming uh, toward the, 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 the coast, and it was totally foggy. And the captain said, well, Mr. Mueller, uh, you're going to have to cancel your speech. Uh, you're gonna, and he wasn't a Christian. He said, you're going to have to cancel your speech. You're going to have to uh, forget about it, and, uh, postpone it or something, because we can't go through this fog. And Mueller said, wait a minute. He said, I've never missed an appointment yet. He said, the Lord's not going to make me miss an appointment. He said, let's pray. And, and the, the guy said, okay. So Mueller got down on his knees, and the captain got down on his knees. And Mueller said, Lord, you know, I have an appointment at 1 o'clock this afternoon. i got to be there. Uh, could you please just take the fog away? And, and, and he, amen, and, and, the, and, and, the, and the captain started to mumble out a prayer, and Mueller said, no, no, I don't want you to pray, because you don't believe. And besides, the fog's gone. They got up, the fog was gone, <laughs> just like that, actual. The guy was, of course, the captain was converted, really converted, and tells a story, and it goes down in history, how God just did it on the... And, and this was the story of his life all through prayer, praying, prayer, the power of prayer. And what he did was he just trusted the promises of God. He said, I believe God who said, ask and it shall be given you. And God will raise up an individual like that once in a while, maybe once in history to encourage us to realize that there's the power of prayer, the power of prayer, and it's based on the promise of God, the promise of God. Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, not anything, the emphasis is not to anything, the emphasis is my name. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. In my name, why? If you can ask in the name of Jesus, it's gotta be the right kind of prayer. Now, you're not going to ask for something sick or stupid uh, in the name of Jesus if you know how to pray. So we talk to the Lord, and that's cold-blooded faith. You don't have to feel anything. You take his promise. He says, I will hear you. I will answer you. I will, I will come to you. I, I will bring you my presence in prayer and power if you will ask, and it shall be given you. 
Worshipful call 